Welcome to We're Libertarians Daily Podcast. I got Dale here. This is Hody. You know Stop. us. What up? We're here. We're going to talk about uh, trade skills, avoiding debt, and the future. Dale, I'm going to need you to start with this one because I'll be honest with you. I am inept with trade skills. And getting, well, getting this topic, I was like, cool. Dale, take it away, and I'm going to mute my microphone for the next 20 minutes. Go, buddy. Don't mute your microphone for the next 20 minutes, Hody Johns. So, <laughs> all right. So, what? since you kind of threw, the, threw that for me, basically, I'm a tradesman. I'm not dressed like one right now, although I am blue collar. But what it amounts to is one of the one of the things I hear about constantly is this this whole student debt crisis. The numbers float around in my head, but I can't articulate them. And micro, there's other folks out there that have, have talked about this. But basically, one of the best ways to avoid student loan debt, if you're not becoming a lawyer, an accountant, or I don't know what else. Professional podcaster professional podcaster you should avoid or if you're if you're not okay if you're not lawyering accounting teaching you need to avoid going to college and i'm being a little more imperial and imperious about this than cody would care for but i'm just going to run with it um you need to go into the eat you need to go into the trades and here and here's why i would say that because the cost of getting in to, to it is relatively low. You can go to a trade, you can go to a, a two year community college and go into one of their trade classes, whether it's the actual hard building trades with, that involve carpentry, plumbing, electrical, painting, drywall, which all of those eventually come together. Um, the cost is relatively low, even if you take the schooling route. Now, typically though, that's not, and most tradesmen will say this, that's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to get an apprenticeship either with a non-union business owner. And please don't maul me libertarians, but you can go join a pipe fitters union or a painting union or whatever type of union you want to go into and get an apprenticeship, do some networking, find a job as an apprentice when you, um, when you go into one of those trades, I was able to go to the go the non-union route because I felt it was faster for me to get my own company going. But if you go the if you go the union route, and I had if you go the union route, you're going to spend about two to four years as an apprentice. You're going to be working for a company. You're going to start off with, you know, doing some of the general labor, some of the grunt work. But eventually, you'll start learning how to piece things together. Now, by trade, I'm a painter and I repair drywall. I don't actually do the drywall building. Um, that's, may, that's my main thing along those lines. But the, I don't really have numbers at this point, but the, but the cost of getting into that trade, into any trade is relatively low compared to going into, going into debt for student loans. I mean, I've, I've read in places that the that to go to a, a fancy four year college, um, people have incurred up to hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. And I may be over exaggerating on that front. And I'll even tell you a little secret. I wasn't going to tell you this, but Ooh, I have a bachelor's spicy. degree. <gasps> I have a bachelor's degree and I fell into the trap and I still went to the trades anyway. And I also have a bachelor's degree. I got my degree in theology. I am. I really loved the college that I went to. However, I'm not using it. So, so you know. Well, well. If I if I turn the turn the conversation sideways, you might start using it. But <laughs> right. We won't do that right now. <laughs> it comes in handy in social situations because you know what, what I was thinking is like, hey, I'm already in speech and debate doing politics. What's something else that can make me really annoying? Oh, I'll study religion because because you know religion and politics means you're the life of every party. So I just well, decided to dedicate my life to those studying those two things. You'd be the life of any party that I would throw because it would be because that's my thing. I have I have a hypostatic union of trade of tradesmithing. Ooh, a theological term there. A hypostatic union of of tradesmithing and philosophy. So yes, the people that I would invite, you would be most welcome. But you'd have to have Heineken zero zero while we're all drinking our adult beverages. So in any case, but getting back to it, yes, I fell into the trap. I don't like talking about it. I'm not going to get into specific numbers, but it would have been if I hadn't had such a a negative experience early on. 
a negative experience early on with, you know, my dad being a union guy, I probably would have gone into the trades and become a painter when I was 18. And we would, we wouldn't even be having this conversation right now, somewhere on a parallel earth, whatever. So get bringing it back to the point though. And I realized Hody just basically gave me, but gave me enough rope to hang myself until I stopped talking. Time um, to die, Dale. No, this is what I deal with every Monday guys. Just here, here he is. <laughs> this is before the mics get started, but in all seriousness, um, one of the, one of the things that, that I've, I've read and I've heard is folks are always like, if you don't go to college, you're going to end up like that guy. And it's garbage, man, electrician, painter, carpenter. Did I say electrician already? Uh, pipe fitter, um, whatever other mill worker, whatever specialty. And the thing of it is by the most recent estimates, there are 5 million unfilled jobs in any of these trades. And even in technical areas that aren't necessarily in the in the original in the main building trades, uh, because people have been evading it, and it's deflated the co- it's deflated the um, the marketability of the bachelor's degree, and it's created this the situation where all these other jobs they're the the if you can get into those program it, get into those jobs, the the wages are are inflated in a good way. Whereas the, the value of a bachelor's degree is slowly as as not slowly but rapidly gone further down, and so we have me, but, so just just to put it in perspective, we have one point three. Well, it was one point three. This is back in two thousand fourteen. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Th- I have stats from two thousand nineteen. Here we go. One point five trillion dollars in student debt. Right? Do we mm-hmm. think that that debt has translated to 1.5 trillion dollars towards the economy, or towards your I, even more importantly than towards the economy? Because that makes you look at like America's debt. We're saying towards like the people's lives, to to your personal life. This is an average of 37 thousand dollars per person. That's hanging over everybody's head. <laughs> That's yes. a, and that is a substantial number to have hanging over your head. Thirty-seven thousand dollars. I've never had a credit card hit that high. I've never bought a car that expensive. We're talking about a very something that should be very valuable, and that's just on average thirty-seven thousand. Right. That includes people that have paid it off or people that never went. That's devastating. That means if you went, you're probably closer to like the hundred thousand dollar category. And yep. They hype it as this is going, oh, it'll pay for itself for sure. And the more that I get older, and I think the economy's changed as well. I think this is very different from our, from our parents' generation. But I think people stopped caring about how much you've studied and how good you are at it. And I yep. can tell you personally, and I, I even love the college that I went to. So, And they taught me a lot about theology, but they taught me a lot. More importantly, they kind of opened my eyes on how to think about something. I was a very, I would say, closed-minded christian until i went to college and what's Mm -hmm. funny is i went to liberty university private baptist college but when you studied hinduism you would learn from a hindu when you studied islam you would learn from a muslim and so i got this very open-minded perspective from experts and so i've it changed my way of thinking into studying from the experts but even then i've learned more about religion by studying on my own than i ever did from college they kind of opened my mind on how to think about things but if I had never got my degree and I instead spent all of those times just using that tool and being open-minded and studying, I would have known more about it than I would have gone to college. And I think this is a betrayal of our country's history. People would look at uh, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia, right? Um, they, they, I remember back, uh, you'll, you'll read from the founding fathers. They talk about the competition between, uh, Prince and King's college. And, uh, and the all of these early colleges, the point was is to say, hey, we're going we want the best lawyers to come from this college. Now all they do is they care about, did you get your degree? Great. I don't care about the college anymore. Why? Because we've regulated it so that it doesn't matter. You know, back then you could be very revolutionary. Thomas Jefferson could say, dude, I want the best lawyers ever coming from my college to study from this legal system. And somebody else could compete and say, I don't like the way you're teaching that. I think my lawyers can beat your lawyers in court. But when's the last time you've seen lawyers compared, depending on where they graduated from college? Never. Why? Because as long as you graduated, it's all the same system. You know, so it really doesn't matter. And so now 
Yeah, and I'm not just saying this is a matter of don't get your degree because it, it's, you know, I have some philosophical, uh, this is true as well, but there's a philosophical problem with schools and regulation and college regulations, but you will learn more outside of school than inside of school. That's a yep. harsh reality, but it is crazy accurate. Uh, I did that uh, episode about the Department of Education. They are letting us down big time. And even if a school is privatized, they still fall under the, hey, but you got to maintain these curriculums, but you have to use these textbooks. Forget mm -hmm. that. Go to the internet. It will teach you more than any textbook you're ever going to get in school. Most of the time, you're going to find a textbook that's better online than the one that you would get in school. So really, I, I mean, I hate to encourage dropouts, but this isn't, if you're dropping out, that's one thing. But if you're seeking a better future, sometimes the better thing to do is to leave. If yes. I had, if you use those four years, instead of going through some mathematical uh, curriculum where they don't really care about you, and you used it to actually study, and heaven forbid, be an entrepreneur and maybe actually build up something instead of going into debt, you'll be so much further ahead building up a business as opposed to trying to start right then. That, those are my thoughts. I'm going to go ahead and let you get back on the wagon, though. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I, there, and there's a lot that ties into it. First of all, here's another reveal, revelation. I went to Liberty University for the first two and a half to three years of my uh, pursuit of a bachelor's degree. And uh, I studied a similar subject to you. I studied pastoral ministries. But that said, um, they, with with going into the trades, it lowers the, it lowers the cost of... Um, of your student debt, even if you have to take out, even if you have to take out a small loan, it's going to be inconsequential compared to how fast you will, how fast you'll make it back, and and then some. And you can avoid the cost oftentimes by just going and talking to people. A lot of times, it's going to involve networking, finding small business owners, depending on which one you want to do, um, even offering, dare I say it, to intern with them and work for free, especially for smaller, like if it's a smaller operation. That's how I got into. That's how I got into painting. I I was picked up by a a smaller, one man show painting operation, and he showed me the ropes. Um, sometimes they're they're crusty, angry boomers, but that's okay, because they're they're not gonna. I, I get the reason why that's okay is because oftentimes those folks, um, they're straightforward to the point. They'll show you how to do it, and there was a you know between. The, the guy who taught me and myself, there was a strong rapport, even though he was tough to deal with at times. Um, he, ulti he ultimately did tell me that he cared that I succeeded. And so that really was a motivator. And he showed me how to cut in. He showed me how to roll out a wall properly. He showed me, you know, we even got into some of the, the billing and, and how to do bids and that sort of thing. I mean, it was a real, it was, I wouldn't say it was a master's education. It was definitely a, um, I learned a lot more faster by being on the job, which ties back into what Hody said. You well, often and, learn and, and let's talk about that real quick. Let me dig into that. So on one end, you've got a college. After you graduate from that college, does your college care about how you do in life? Probably Absolutely not. not. They hope that you make enough so that you can give them money later. You get the letters later, which is like, hey, want to donate more of your money? I know we already charged you an overpriced the first time, but would you like to give us some more money maybe? Other than that, they don't really care how you're doing. If you go to an app apprenticeship, you're the person who, the, your master, your person who gives you the, app the apprenticeship absolutely has an incentive to make sure you're doing well. If you say, oh yeah, I went to this college, people would say like, oh, well, you could have gotten any number of teachers and who knows and, you know, and so nobody cares. Whereas if you say, no, I learned medicine from my dad, then my dad is going to make sure I'm not a total screw up when, when I ad administer medicine, right? Because that's the incentive. I don't want to see you screw up because that makes me look bad. That's my dad's reputation. So, I mean, that, that ties into the family business when you talk about if, bringing it back to trade skills. Carpentry, great example. You know, if you said, yeah, I'm bringing my kid up to be a good carpenter like me, well, then you care. Now, even if this isn't within the family, you say, you know, I, I you know, let's say you don't, you don't have to be licensed to work on cars. Anybody can work on cars. If you're licensed right. to work on cars, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, I always tell people, um, Bernie Madoff was licensed as a financial expert and he did nothing but steal everybody's money. So the licensing right. is really kind of irrelevant. You know, they don't care that you pay them money and as long as you're paying them money, 
thumbs up. They're good for it. Whereas if you learn something else like manufacturing or working on cars to go to the prior example, that person cares that you know what you're doing, not only because you might actually end up working at their business, but because that's their reputation on the line. And you say, yeah, I studied from this guy. And they say, oh, yeah, that's a great guy to study from. Or if that person's a screw up, just be like, oh, yeah, that doesn't count at all. And that creates incentive for your the person who gives you the apprenticeship to to maintain a high level of study, you know, much more than what your college is required that you do. You get C's, you flake out in class, you bribe your teachers a little bit. I mean, that's in the news now, you know, and and you've got yourself a degree, you know, and, and that's what licensing is right now. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's you're right. You're right. One of the other things is with one of the things I want to address is limiting beliefs. Now, I joked with Hody about this at the beginning. A lot of folks will say, well, I don't know how, how fast I can get into it. It's going to take me a while. I'm like, well, that's a limiting belief right there. What you can do is go find five or six you know, different, if you're not sure of which trade you want to go into, find five or six guys, see if they'll let you bring them coffee because they're often on the job doing their thing and just show up and talk to them. Um, some, depending on the organization or the person, you may need to actually, you know, go through the process of sending out a resume and a letter. Fine. That's how I got on with, uh, with the, with the gentleman that trained me initially. <clears throat> and, you know, you, you, it's just taking the initiative, bring them something of value. Even if it's just, you know, you bring donuts to the office and say, Hey, listen, I'm trying to get into the trades. I want to figure out which one I'm, I want to go into. Would you let me shadow with you for a day or a week? Um, I'll even carry your tools around, whatever. Um, that usually works better on the on the non-union and independent side of the house. If it's a small business, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, with the if you're going to go the union route, there's a process. You have to go down to the union hall, fill out an application, and that sort of thing. But still, even then, um, you've still got to you've still got to find a job, even though you might be in the union and doing the classes, and they're showing you the the technique, whatever it is that you're looking to do. The other thing is. Whenever you build something, whether it's you're doing something digital or you're doing something with your hands, every day, once you get into the trades, even as an apprentice, you're going to have a sense of accomplishment at the end of that. Even if you're just installing light switches or in my case, as a painter, you're just, you know, you're taping out an entire house or you're, <clears throat> excuse me, or you're just filling holes or pole sanding. Um, I, I actually really love being in the trades, even though it is it is hard work. Um, but to, to the point is you're going to have a sense of accomplishment at the end of it. And if you, if you go across the, the practically, you go across the five or six different trades and you find one that resonates you, with you, great. Then drill down to that one and show your, and then what you have to do at that point, you don't have a skill, but what you need to do is, is show up and, you know, talk to the, the owner of the business. Like, Hey, listen, I really like painting or drywall repair. I, I like, or built putting up, I enjoyed working with you today. Could we pursue this further and and just go from there? Use your soft skills, and then eventually, you know, you'll get to the point where you've you're able to put up sixty squares of of drywall in a day, or you know, you're able to roll out an entire house in a day. Whatever, if you're if you're a painter. So that that's really bringing it back to to final thoughts. That's my thing. You have to go after it. You can't let yourself think that you're going to be bad at it, even if you think you're a klutz. You're not really a klutz. That's a matter of honing the skill and working with your hands. I was accused of being a klutz early on, and eventually I got to the point where I'm like, yeah, I can do this. I can handle a saw and not – I have all five fingers still. <laughs> I went and took my mission trip to Mexico. Did and uh, Yeah, and uh, the, the locals <laughs> called me torpe, which just means clumsy, which doesn't sound very, very mean. Apparently in Spanish, like, it's actually a, a really bad insult to be called torpe. Like, it, it, it's it's almost like a swear word <laughs> to be called that. Uh, obviously, it's not as, we don't view it as bad to be clumsy here. But uh, I relate to you in that regard. I was always bumping into things. You know, of course, you're helping build churches and, and uh, you have to work with your hands a lot. Of course, I had no training whatsoever, thankfully. All 10 fingers as well. One of them's right. a little shorter than the others, you might notice. That, but, you know. Okay, whatever. That's fake. <laughs> fake <kidding>. news. <laughs> fake news. But yeah, it, it it's something that that you can overcome. Like you said, you, you, you work with a little bit, you practice a little bit. I don't know that anybody's clumsy so much as they are just unrehearsed. 
And if you practice that's at a, something well enough, you'll be okay. That's absolutely right. You, if you if you practice, even if it's in small things, I mean, you know, I yeah, I, I can't give a whole lot of personal stories because there's so many of them. But you know, I was I was accused of that, and now I'm you know I'm running my you know my contracting and. You know, there's there. I mean, you will have klutz times, but it it doesn't happen very often for me anymore. It's just a matter of honing both that that um, that motor skill, I guess that's what they call it, and then of course honing your skill craft. And that's just being willing to, you know, take your lumps when you screw up. There's going to be different, you know, in, in different trade skills or in different companies. Sometimes mm -hmm. the guy's going to be a hard ass, and you know, you're going to have to learn to take your lumps and not be a snowflake. Oh no, I said a trigger word. But there's other folks that are professional. They'll be like. They understand. Some of them understand the psychology of it. They're like, okay, you know, you screwed up. Let's go over what went, what happened, and let's find a path to not doing it again. And a lot of that's just honing your own internal monologue. So, but it, it, to recap it, if you want to avoid the student debt, if you want to avoid um, being part of that crisis, if you want to find fulfillment, go into the trades, try things out, and then get on a path. You'll be making you'll be making money in a very short amount of time and lots of it. So it's, it's kind of time for final thoughts ish. And, mm -hmm. uh, so Joe, I'm talking with him. Uh, he's sending some good, good feedback right now on my page. He's, he's, uh, we're actually going to be talking about energy and, mm -hmm. uh, getting, uh, the problem with grid energy and the lack of options thereof. We're going to be talking about that, uh, that on Friday. So that's something to look forward to. But he has uh, he has some experience in this regard, and he's commenting, and it's just he, he's the construction manager manager in an energy oil and get in the energy oil and ga gas sector, mm -hmm. and he's talk, he he leaves the comment that a good welder can make a hundred thousand dollars a year with just two years of training. Boom. So here is something that I, I I'm going to leave you with my final thoughts. I am not in the trade industry, but don't allow the stigma to scare you away. There is absolutely societal stigma when it comes to trade skills. Uh, we ha we talk about plumbers crack. I think we all have a an image in our heads when we think about a stereotypical uh, per, uh, auto technician. Uh, and there's a lot of there's a lot of those things that society kind of perpetuates on us to to us feeling like that's not a good line of work, but. It can be an awesome line of work. It can yes. be it can be a six figure a year kind of work. And if you are working in something that's considered more respectable, look, I worked in mortgage, made like forty thousand dollars a year. And if I was really great at sales, if I was great at sales, like best in the company at sales, I probably could have made sixty thousand dollars a year. Guess what? Forty plus hour work weeks, benefits are just kind of meh, and uh, cold calling sales not fun right and and when we're talking about trade skills we're talking about skills that are definitely applicable and so don't allow the stigma to scare you away from going into this maybe your family's putting you through it even more than society in general but just saying like no you need to go to college this, this isn't a good thing to do this is scary man try it and then here's the thing is even if it even if it's not your cup of tea you've saved more money than you would by dropping out of college <laughs> Right. If you drop out of college and find out that's not your cup of tea, too bad. That's, there's a couple hundred thousand dollars that I think the average person spends a decade trying to pay off. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a 10 year backtrack versus just a couple years. And secondly, this is actually something that um, I was talking with Trisha Stewart about uh, about about what the, a collapse would look like. And I was looking at mainstream economists. These aren't like anarchists or somebody crazy, but mainstream anar anarchists are like, oh, man, if you know trade skills, uh, and the economy collapses in every society where the economies collapse. Those who understood trade skills went from being middle of the road, blue collar workers to being millionaire billionaires compared to the rest of the country. These there are the go. things that are going to become valuable. So if you're really feeling negative about the future, it's a great way to be prepared to say like, I have a skill that is very practical. That's going to be okay. I don't want, I didn't. And I told you before this episode, I didn't want this to become a, a dig on something. If you do something impractical, like I said, I'm not very good at trade skills, but I feel like I can do something to tell you not to be afraid to say that. I, I mean, I goodness knows. I wish that I knew somebody that I trusted that worked on cars, that worked on plumbing, that worked on lighting, that worked on energy. We need to focus on deregulating these, the colleges, we need to focus on making them competitive again. 
But until mm-hmm. that happens, until we get the licensing reform that we want, well, I say reform, until we get rid of the licensing like we would like to do, that we are stuck in this place. And if we're going to be stuck in this place, let's protect ourselves. And the trade skills can be a great way to do that, avoid the debt, and really take care of your future and prepare yourself and your family for, for whatever may come. And even if it doesn't come, hey, we're still using them in the meantime. So you might Absolutely. not end up being that millionaire if the economy never actually does collapse, but six figures isn't so bad in the meantime, right? <laughs> and no. Dale, <laughs> Dale, I'll let you have the final words on this one. Um. One of the things that I had I had learned, um, and this is this also comes from Mike Rowe, if you see everybody going one way, go the opposite way. And as libertarians, we're contrarians, so that should come naturally to us. That's the first thing that you need to remember. Second thing is you have a I'm just, I know I'm a broken record right now, but you'll have a great sense of accomplishment once you've mastered whichever trade you're going into. Um, you'll You'll be able to save money on your home improvement costs if you're, you know, doing something in your house, and you'll evade you'll evade that, you know, average thirty to forty thousand dollar debt um, if you go if you go that way. And even if you find out that later on you don't like it, you really do want to become an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor, you you can do that, and you can put yourself through school if you if you have a good skill. So those are my final thoughts. Don't be afraid. Screw the stigma, and get after it awesome guys thank you again for joining us stale always a pleasure to talk to you my friend it is go Likewise. visit him simplisticadvice.com we libertarians.com if you're not signed up on the patreon i don't even know what to tell you at this point man like we are Just doing do it. we are libertarians doing such good things we got our own journal we got magazines we got like almost 50 people on this network now we're giving more and more voices we're catching more people my goodness, we're starting to break 20,000 like downloads per episode. I mean, this is exploding. And That's the tremendous. only way it happens, the only way we can keep doing is if you signed up on Patreon. So just please think about it. If you don't have the money to give, consider donating a little bit of your time. We got a research team. We have a book club we'd love for you to discuss and be a part of. If you are an expert at something and you can think of something that you really want to talk about, feel free to contact me. Come on the show. Donate your time. Spread the message that way. But uh, if none of the above, definitely consider patreon.com slash we're libertarians because we are making this world freer People that know us are doing great things, whether it's politics or not, whether it's leaving a bad marriage or, oh, heck, just the other day, helping some kids get out of an abusive situation at home. This is something that is not changing lives just because we spout off good ideas better than the other guys spout off good ideas. This is a cultural change. This is a societal change. And this is just a great thing to be a part of. So just please be a part of it. Dale and I are too. And we'd love to have you in this family. We would. Uh, Yeah, big time. So again, thank you so much. Until then, keep fueling the fires of liberty.